Hallelujah. Well, turn over to Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Uh, I do believe that the Lord wants to do some uh, things today. And so um, my greatest assignment is to realize when he's ready to do that. Uh, I do know it's coming through some teaching so that people's faith can rise. But at some point, uh, he's going to say now and I'm going to respond. All right. And so um, I believe you need to let your faith grow so that we can receive what God wants. In Luke chapter 12, verse 32, it says this, do not be afraid. Look to your neighbor and say, do, do not be afraid. So again, God through both his old covenant and new covenant is always admonishing those connected to him, don't be in fear. Fear is something that we should not allow to dominate us. And when we recognize fear or the, the attempt of being afraid about something is coming, make no mistake about it. God is saying, do not be afraid. Amen? Aren't you glad you can live fearless? Yes. It says, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. He's not here to withhold the kingdom from you. He's not here to uh, have you wait for the kingdom once you pass from this life into the next. He has chosen gladly to give you access to his kingdom right now. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes. See, the Bible's about a king, his kingdom, and his royal offspring. That's what the context of this scriptures have been always been about. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times we'll take things of God and turn them into religion. And there's a lot of religions that if you actually study them, uh, you'll see a lot of aspects that are actually with, contained within this book. Um, but, you know, religion by all rights is taking something about God and formulating it in a way that we're telling God how he should respond to us and how we want him to respond to us. And if we do these particular things, he must. Where the kingdom of God is where the king sits on the throne and says, this is how I would need you to respond to me. And so we have a king that sits on the throne. Thrones are in kingdoms, not religions. And notice the father has chosen gladly not to give you salvation, but the kingdom. Now that doesn't mean you're not saved. I mean, you need to be saved. And salvation's important. But there's more to God than just being saved or receiving salvation. The Father's actually chosen to, get, to gladly give you his kingdom. Salvation is what gives us entrance into the kingdom. So it gives us the ability to come past a threshold. Jesus said, I'm the door. He said, I'm the door. And he said, no man comes to the Father but through me. The only way into my Father's kingdom is through me. I'm the door. Well, what does he mean? He said, I am payment. I am the price paid for your life, for all your wrongdoing, for everything that we've done. Even in the, our best attempts to try to be right with God, the reality is we needed Jesus. And when we recognize that and we acknowledge Jesus as Lord, Lord is not a religious word. It literally means supreme in authority. The best vernacular we have in the United States today is landlord, of which we are landlords at Anchor Faith Church. We currently own 2121 US 1 South. So by all rights, we are owners of property, and so that when tenants come to the mall or lease from here, we are their landlord, which means we have supreme authority to determine how they are in the space. Jesus Christ has supreme authority. So when we call on Jesus to save us, what we're actually doing is saying, no longer my way of doing life, I'm doing it your way. You're Lord. I, get, I throw aside my way, I choose your way. And again, the scripture is very clear. His ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But that scripture doesn't mean that they're not obtainable. We can know his thoughts. We can know his will. In fact, in 1 John tells us that when we know his will, we have confidence. This is the confidence that we have if we ask him anything according to his will, which means his will must be obtainable. 
So again, we're not, you don't use that scripture to act like God's so far removed and so wise and everything that we'll never be able to understand anything about him. So we're just kind of subject to case or whatever will be, will be existence as believer. No, the Bible says seek him. He said, if you seek, you'll find. If you knock, the door will be open. If you ask, it'll be given. So we can find out exactly what God is thinking or his will is concerning things in life. Man, we have such a good father. Amen? Amen. And so um, Adam, who was created in the image of God in Genesis chapter 1, the planets made, and God created the heavens and the earth, and then he places man in there, and he said for him to have dominion to rule over the earth, but when Adam ate the fruit he wasn't, he gave that dominion away, and the enemy, we call, the Bible calls him the devil, or Satan, became the God of this world. Second Corinthians chapter 4, 4 says that he is the God of this world. He's deceived. Now, when we say world, we're not saying he owns planet earth. We're saying the systems that are on the earth, he controls. He controls. He controls that. You can't be the God of a world and have no control. But now God has control of his world, of his system, and ultimately he controls his word. Whatever he says, it's going to come to pass. Amen. So no matter what the enemy's doing underneath his authority, although he has authority because Adam was given that authority, it required Jesus to manifest or to show up to come to the earth in order to redeem back what Adam lost because God gave earth or dominion to man, gave dominion to man. And as a result of that, it required a man to take it back. But it's just not any man. It's the Son of God, God clothed in the flesh. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The Passion Translation says it this way. So don't be afraid, dearest friends. Your loving Father genu joyously gives you his kingdom realm with all its promises. Amen. So the kingdom of God has promises associated with it. No different than the United States has um, rights for its citizens, so does God have for his. And when we respond to God based upon what he says is ours as his children, then we can have that. Amen. And we can receive it by faith. And since God has chosen gladly to give us his kingdom realm or the kingdom, the kingdom again is not only um, associated with uh, a place to live after we die. All right? This is not about assignment after life. This is about being a son of God now and bringing God's kingdom realm to us today. Okay? And so God's kingdom realm wants to manifest um, become visible in our life so much that people would begin to say, you're not of this world. You're not of this world. We are, by all rights, ambassadors for Christ. Meaning then, we have been appointed by the king to represent him in the earth. And don't you know, all governments take care of their ambassadors. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, God's kingdom has opportunities or promises for us that we can tap into today. This is why Jesus said this. He said, our Father, Matthew chapter 6, you know this scripture. And because of that particular scripture, we've quoted it at ball games everywhere, you know. But do we really believe what it says? He says, our Father, which is not his Father, but is your dad, if you're born again. If you're a child of God. So it's your daddy as much as Jesus' daddy. He said, when you pray, our Father who art in heaven, means he lives, that's his realm, right? Who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom. Kingdom what? Notice not kingdom wait. Not pray that when you die, you'll get to see his kingdom one day. No, he says, your kingdom come, your will be done where? On earth. So his will can be done here. His kingdom 
can be demonstrated its power, its authority, and all that's associated with God's government. Because kingdom by all rights is not heaven. It is king's dominion. The king's domain. Are you hearing me? It's the place where he has his authority and all that he offers to his children and citizens are available to them no matter where they're at. Hallelujah. And so, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we know that there's no issue in heaven. <laughs> I said there's no issue in heaven. Sin is not in heaven. Sin is not in heaven. And when the enemy rebelled in heaven, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's how God deals with things that are unrighteous. He removes them from his presence. Right? He removes them. And he was cast down. Well, you understand why he went after Adam, because Adam looked just like God. And, and Satan only wants one thing, is that God to bow down and worship him. Notice, he wants him to bow down. See, this is what you do before a king. He wants to be acknowledged as the supreme ruler. But there's only one supreme ruler. I said there's only one supreme ruler, and that's the Lord himself. Hallelujah. The Lord is supreme ruler of all. Adam could have cast the enemy out in the garden. But instead, he ate the fruit, and he gave him power. Well, what kind of power does he have? Well, he has this power. Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says this. Look how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. So a weapon or a strategy or something within the um, power of the enemy is to somehow increase death in your body. It's called sickness and disease. Because Adam fell from dominion, the Lord said, from dust you came, dust now you'll return. Which means now there's a process of decay happening in your skin suit. Now, with Adam, that process was a lot longer than today. I mean, he lived to be 903 years old, I believe it is. Right? That's our 30, one of those. Uh, he lived a long time. You know, and if you look at the re re recording of Scripture, you know, those that were on the planet initially, they, were, they, were, they lived a long time. But it shouldn't be surprising because God never wanted Adam to experience death in the first place. The problem that we have is that we're in an earth now that only knows death. That's all we know. So it seems that this is normal. But if you read the first two chapters of Genesis, that was abnormal. It was never supposed to be here. And if you read the last two chapters of Revelations, 21 and 22, it won't exist on this planet then. Because the Bible says we'll get a new heaven and a new earth. Woo, hallelujah. And that the new Jerusalem will come down out of heaven to the earth. So get used to the planet. I know people are saying it's going to be destroyed. It is by the Lord through burning. But it's not like going to blow up and be gone. It's not like it's going to cease to exist. He will burn it with fire. And I've had someone say this. Well, if the Lord's going to burn it all with fire, which Peter says it is, you know, how are the people going to survive? The same way Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. I don't care how hot it is. Seven times hotter than hot, it doesn't matter. We'll be able to stand in the midst of the fire with the Lord when he does his renovation of this planet so that it'll be new where only righteousness will dwell and his kingdom will be the only thing on the planet. Woo! Glory to God. That's all that'll be there. Man, this is hope. This is what we're looking for. But you know what he's saying? He said, even though the conditions of the earth are not exactly as they're going to be, I can still bring my realm into it. I can do it. All you have to do is believe. 
That's all you have to do is believe. And so many times we become so limited, uh, the Christians that is, is that we only see this Jesus died for me and when I die now, I get to go be with him. Do you understand God isn't even waiting to be with you when you die? The minute you're born again, he came to you. Isn't that awesome? The Lord's not like, okay, now we got it. You're coming to heaven. That's not what he did. He's like, okay, that spirit that was dead didn't, couldn't hear me, couldn't talk to me, couldn't fellowship with me, always did wrong, always did bad, no matter how much it tried to do right, it was in constant rebellion against my kingdom. Now I'm going to put a new one in there inside you. And it's going to be in the image of my son, Jesus. You're going to look like him, be able to talk like him. You'll be able to function like him. And by all rights, now you're his DNA. You're the child of a king because he's the king of kings. He said, but I'll do better than that. Yep, there's more. Right? And he said, I'm going to put my Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, he's going to come and live inside you where you'll become the temple of the Holy Ghost. And he's going to bear witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. So this is what's going on on the inside of you. The Holy Ghost is like, you're a child of God. What you doing? You're a child of God. Go ahead and stand up. You're a child of God. Go ahead and believe. Go. You're a child of God. This is what Dad said in heaven. Now act on it. Right. You have dominion. You have rulership. You've conquered this. You've overcome this because he overcame this. The blood's giving you the right. The blood's giving you the right. Jesus like, greater seed is in you. So God's not like, glad you're, glad you're born again. Can't wait to see you. He's moved in. <laughs> He said, man, it's so good to see you, so good to talk to you again, so good to have a conversation with you. Oh, I cannot wait for you to open up your Bible right now because I'm going to tell you everything Jesus is talking about. I'm going to explain this stuff. I'm going to let you see this kingdom. I'm going to let it be in your life. I'm going to let it demonstrate to you. Man, Dad's been waiting to talk to you for quite some time. He's wanting to fellowship with you. I'm so glad I moved in. Yet there's more. Not only will I bear witness that you're a child of God, I'm going to give you power. So I'm going to come upon you, and I'm going to do you with power, and I'm going to give you power, and it's going to allow you to operate in my gifts. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to give you a language of the kingdom that when you don't know how to pray in your natural one, you can pray in the spirit. I'll give you utterance, and I will pray out the perfect will of God right here for you on earth. Man, how awesome is that? Benefits that come with the kingdom. And many are just holding on in fear, waiting. The world's going so bad, Pastor. The world's so terrible. Oh, my gosh. It's, why are you afraid? You have the greatest force on the inside of you. If you'll learn of him and acknowledge him and yield to him, he'll never make you because it's a relationship. A relationship that's not dysfunctional, let's put it that way. See, you're like, God, just make me be right. That's what the enemy does. He forces. Demons force. God allows you to yield. Doesn't violate your choice. Encourages you to lay your will down and take up his will. Because I'm not going to make you love me. This is what's so awesome. You know, the more I understand the plan of God, I'm like, wow, he is so genius. <laughs> Everyone in eternity with him will have been tried in a level that, they, that there's no doubt they wanted to be with him, period. No one a billion years from now and, and, and time calculations of eternity is going to say, you know, I don't know that this heaven thing and this relationship with God was like really what I wanted now. I'm, I'm reconsidering. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. They will have want, and, he, and here's the thing. He's like, they love me. They want, they want to be here. I have no one with me that doesn't want to be with me. Wow, how awesome is that? Because if you're not with him, you just don't want to be. 
there's one benefit of the kingdom of God that the Lord wants me to minister to you today because he wants to demonstrate it. And it's in Matthew chapter 8, verse 2 and 3. We talked about this on Wednesday night. We were talking a little bit about faith. And the Lord told me on the way home after the basketball game, actually, wow, I'm telling you, that men's basketball game was like nail-biter. I mean, they came from behind and then got behind again and then came all the way back. Oh, man, it was just like I was on an emotional roller coaster, man. <laughs> it was like, whoa, come on. Uh, unfortunately, you know, that last shot didn't go in, and um, they didn't close the deal, but it was a phenomenal game. The women, they, they won that game. The last time I watched the women's game, they didn't win at all, so it was good to see them get a victory. And, um, but, man, what an awesome time we had over there. But as I was going home, he spoke to me. He said, launch from here. It says this, and the leopard came. Leopard's got a disease. Sickness and disease is not of God. He's not the author of it. Okay? The leper came to him and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing. That's a condition, conditional statement. He's like, you know, I'm not sure. I don't know. If you're willing, you can cleanse me. Because he knows that God didn't put this on me. I believe you could take care of it, but I don't know whether or not you want to. And so Jesus stretched out his hands and touched him and says, says this, I am willing. So he answers it, period. That is a answered question. Now, we get this context. So again, many times people are always asking this conversation. But if you actually read the Bible, again, all the way through the book, you'll see it's been, always been God's will to heal. This is just a captured conversation when someone didn't know and he answered the question, I am. That's like, how can I help us understand this? That's as if you come to me and say, you know, um, you know now, uh, Pastor Earl, uh, you're the senior pastor. If you're willing, you could allow me to whatever, right? Because I have some authority as a pastor. And then I say, I, yes, we do that. That's it. Whatever. That doesn't mean you have to keep asking every time on that particular thing. I've settled that. But because, you know, most of the time we don't read the Bible in its entirety and then stay in the Word of God, uh, you know, we find ourselves wondering whether or not it's God's will on the, some of the same subject matters. Let me ask this question. Is it God's will to, to save humanity from their sin? So we would never instruct someone to pray, now, Lord, I know you can save me from my sin if you're willing. We would never do that. Never would we do that. Nor would we, for that particular um, you know, occasion, say, now, after you pray, I'm not sure when you're going to get born again. It could happen in a week or two. No, if you believe, you got it right then. And there are some healings. I won't say all because there's gifts of the Spirit called gifts of healings and working of miracles. And that's something that regular faith cannot tap. It does require God to get involved. Why do I say that? Because a lot of times we think that when people have something going on in their body, that ultimately, you know, um, um, we think we know what the answer is. But that's not the case. Uh, let's go with hearing impaired. Some that are deaf were hearing once, but a sickness came. It took their hearing, and they have all the things necessary to hear, but something shut down. Some don't even have it developed. Now, why do I say this? Because you have to know what's going on. You just can't assume Jesus, which you think like, he knows everything. But have you, if you notice when you look at him dealing with people that were sick, he would ask questions like, what do you want? Right. Remember, blind man Bartimaeus comes up to him and he's like, what do you want from me? That should be like, no brainer. Right. But just because someone has something doesn't mean they want to get rid of it. Right. They may not. Are you hearing me? He said, I want to see. And the Lord said, according to your faith, you did. And he did. But another guy came to him and couldn't see. And the Lord just didn't speak to him. He like spit in some mud. Yeah. Yeah. Now follow me. He spit in some mud, 
put it on the guy's eyes and say, now go wash it off. Now what in the world's dirt got to do with healing? Yeah. Everything, if what was necessary for him, for him to see was not formed in the womb, and he needed to add that part. You said, what do you mean add it? Well, how was Adam made in the beginning? Out of the dust of the earth. So basically, he put the missing parts through the dirt and said, now go wash it off. Hallelujah. But he knew something different here than the other. So again, you know how many people get offended because not everyone's getting healed? Well, if God healed everybody, then why aren't everybody getting healed? Well, not everybody wants to be healed. Right. And some things are going to actually require a working of miracles or a gifts of healing, which are only as the Spirit leads. And it's not like the Spirit's not willing per se, but some of those healings are for a very specific time that opens up a whole nother thing concerning God's kingdom. Period. But now there is a healing that can come by faith. Yes. Period. By faith. I mean, you believe, you receive. Yes. And it can come also through what's called the laying on of hands or a touch. Yes. I want to talk about the touch today. Because I'm going to be very specific. The Lord wants to heal you today through touch. And I'm going to show that is a biblical way for you to receive healing so that the symptoms that are in your life can leave. Yes. All right. Yes, Lord, I'll do that. The Lord just wanted me to say, now, listen, this is not foreign for you because in the natural, when you go to the doctor, they'll have you sit down. And the first thing that the nurse and the doctor are going to do is they're going to touch you. Now, their touch doesn't heal you, but their touch allows them to diagnose symptoms. They're going to talk to you. Why are they talking to you? Because they do not have any idea, unless they were literally a spirit-filled and had spent time with God, and God said, this patient's going to come in, and you can go in and tell them what there is, and you got a word of knowledge concerning their condition. That can happen. But how many times has that happened in your life with your doctor? Okay, so thank you. They come in and they ask questions. They're like, so what's going on? What are you feeling? What are your symptoms? Because in order for me to determine what we can do to try to alleviate you of this pain, discomfort, or whatever, I need to be able to gain information, knowledge, so that we can move in the right direction. Back in the day, you know, just give them some castor oil and you're going to be good, right? That was a cure-all, whatever that, you know. <laughs> right? Some of y'all got some, it works for everything. <laughs> I understand. But they ask questions. But then they go beyond asking questions. Now they, they can actually uh, do things to your body to determine. Well, now, based upon what they say, it could be this. So if I touch this, if I look at this, if we examine this, and we see the response in the body that is signs that it's that, then we'll lean towards, let's treat this. Right? right? And sometimes they're like, we can't tell from the outside, we need to draw your, because your blood will start talking. The blood's always talking. Your blood's always talking. The Lord always hears the blood. Not only is God's blood talking for us, but your blood is always talking to the Lord. Always. And so they'll draw your blood, they'll run it through labs, and then they come back and they begin to talk to you about stuff that you didn't even know existed in your body. They can break you down to, a, to the molecular level. They can get down to your DNA. Come on, you hear what I'm saying? Many people have gone in and come to find out they had cancer and they had no idea. They weren't feeling it. The effects of what was in them had not manifested at such a place that it started to manifest destruction. But it was in there. And a lot of times those physicians say, the good news, we caught it early. We can treat it. Okay. We can treat it. And let me tell you, those people, they rejoice. 
but yet they do deal with fear. Because what if the treatment doesn't work? And we know if you get cancer, you die. Cancer kills. Cancer's a big name, but that name's under Christ. I said that name's under Christ. It's under Christ. He has the name above all names. Those aren't proper names. Those aren't just people names. That's anything. That's anything. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So Jesus stretched out his hand, touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And what took place to this guy in Matthew chapter 8, verses 2 and 3, immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Leprosy is a, uh, it eats your skin. It's a disease that basically eats your skin. It causes it to rot. So it's like, an, uh, it's like acceleration of body decay. You know, when you go to the earth, your, when you die and you leave your skin suit, your body starts to, I mean, it's breaking down now, but I mean, it accelerates. Well, leprosy is like a, a form of that that you get to watch while you're actually in the suit. And so Jesus heals him, which means that gets removed. Isn't that good news? And listen, when this was around, this was considered not curable. So you understand, Jesus was in a society where it says, this can't be cured. And he's like, that's easy. So know this, you may be in a society where they're saying these things are uncurable. Okay. Let's look at Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, verses 25 to 34, it says this, A woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, what she do? She heard about Jesus. She came up in the crowd behind him, touched his cloak, for she thought, if I... Just touch his garment, I will get healed. Immediately the flow of blood had, was dried, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately Jesus perceived in himself that power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd, and said, Who touched me? And his disciples said, Do you see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth, told him everything. Okay, and he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Now, I want to key in on this word affliction because in the King James, it calls it plague. And out of Rick Renner's uh, Sparkling Gem book, volume two, he says this, this Greek word plague is borrowed from the world, from the world uh, term of torture. So he was surprised when he saw this Greek word because he's like, that actually most of the time means torture. He says specifically the word denotes the act of recurring, recurrently beating a prisoner or victim. Once the prisoner's wounds are, had mended, the torturers would bring them back to the whipping post where they would strike again and again and again. These beatings were sporadic but constant. And although they were not serious enough to kill the victim, it kept them in constant pain and misery. It was torment, abuse, a scourge that caused great suffering and prolonged anguish. So what is this word plague or this word affliction as referred to here in Mark chapter 5 verse 29? It's an ailment, sickness, or affliction that regularly strikes an individual again and again. It is a recurring condition that is not serious enough to kill, but that continually keeps the individual sick and miserable. It is a sick, demented elongated, devilish attack upon an individual's physical body that causes discomfort and pain. He said, there are conditions that come and go, can last for years, and rarely permanently respond to medication or the treatment of physicians. 
So this is what this woman was obviously going through. It was something for 12 years. It was ongoing. She obviously went to the doctors. I want to say this. When she came back and told Jesus everything, which tells us she let him know, I'd gone to the doctors. I've had this for 12 years. There's a few things that are really uh, telling of her convert, her story um, that can really get her technically in a lot of trouble, even to the point that she could die. Because when a person had a flow of blood, according to the Jewish uh, law, they had to walk around and say, unclean, unclean. Which means then if they got in a crowd and, and, and on one side, you're almost, I almost thought to myself, why did she just not say unclean? She could have divided a crowd and not have to you know, fall down on her hands and knees and drag through to get to them. But at the end of the day, obviously, she didn't want to be discovered. She did not want to be, per didn't want to be pushed to the side. She wanted to get to Jesus, and she was not going to let a technicality. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Now, I say technicality, meaning I know I could die if they find out, but I'm getting to Jesus. Yeah. Some of you need to have this. I don't care if it looks like I could die or not. I'm getting to Jesus. Yeah. And so she pressed through to get to Jesus. Obviously, that becomes discovered. So technically, they don't know, and they probably denied it because, again, if you got touched by a person with the issue of blood, then you were unclean to the rest of the day. You had to go clean your clothes, and you were, and you know they're probably, she didn't touch me, because I don't want to have to take a bath and be separated from society for half a day. You know, and how would you know? You're in a crowd, right? Um, but that was one issue. The second thing is, as she said, man, I went to the doctors. You know, they could not do it. You know, there were treatments that happened. Could have seemed like it worked based upon this Greek word that it worked at times. But the reality is it just kept coming, just kept coming, just kept coming. I just don't get rid of it. At the end of the day, it's not killed me, but man, it's miserable. And that issue of blood hinders her from going to the house of the Lord and being at a worship in the temple. Yeah. So she wants to have this thing done. Now, notice Jesus didn't say, well, silly woman, why'd you go to the doctor? Right. He never said that nor rebuked her. So it's crazy thinking that when we preach that God heals, that we're also saying, don't go to the doctor. That is not true. In fact, I communicate to our congregation many times, if they're not seeing a symptom change or leave and they've yet to go to a doctor, I'm like, you need to go to a doctor to try to figure out exactly what's going on here. Because it's better for you to know because I have done this here where I prayed for a person's a part of their body that was hurting them, but still relayed, go, you know, to the doctor. Jesus even said this in their system after he uh, healed the 10 lepers. He said, go show yourself to the priest. He didn't say, I healed you. You don't have to tell nobody. You don't have to show nobody. You don't have to go nowhere to prove it. It's proof in your body. No, he said, this is how this validates what you just experienced. Because sometimes God wants you to have validation. Yeah. Oh, Sometimes God has no problem with you going back to the doctor to them to tell you, you don't have cancer at all anymore. Yeah. Well, what was there is gone. Amen. That way, if the devil tries to put something back on you, you'll say, no, no, no. I got a doctor report that God healed me then. He healed me. Now, you're not like, he can't come against you and say, you only thought he was, had healed you because you felt better uh, for about a month, but you never were really healed by God. You're like, liar. <laughs> His word's always true, and, and the natural substantiated it. Amen? Amen. Well, I, this particular case, you know, I laid hands. They uh, went to the doctor, come to find out where we laid hands on for relief. And it got relief there, but it wasn't the issue. There was something else going on in the body. And because of that, that's where the real source. Now we know how we can speak, how we can believe. I know a particular individual in our church that had cancer, couldn't seem to whip that thing at all. No, it, nothing was going. Finally, I went to their house and I said, listen, we going to have a, it, we going to have exposure conversation right now. Because as much as you know about the subject of healing and God heals and this isn't off your body at this juncture, then there must be something deeper that we've missed, something in uh, clicking we need to find out. We got to get it. Well, the first thing manifests that they were offended. Well, offense to keep sickness in your body. But because of that, once that got 
you know, fix, so, so to speak, there was still challenge. I'm like, you're going to the doctor. Here's the thing. If you're not real with yourself and your own personal diagnosis concerning your relationship with God in your heart, not only with God, but with people, yeah. Yeah. then you can go far enough in a symptom that you may know its origination and then eventually say, yeah, it's not gone because I have this heart issue. Now I dealt with this heart issue, and that area, it could have spread or touched somewhere else that you're unaware of. Yeah. So when this individual actually went to the doctor, like, you're going. Not only did they find out the place that they knew cancer started wasn't there, yeah. had died when they removed it. But there was other places in their body they were unaware of because it had already spread. But because we were able to come together, the word worked in their life today, serving here, man, just doing the will of God for their lives. Hallelujah. Alive today. You want a meeting? Stand up, Randy Clay. Don't tell me God doesn't heal. Because God is the healer. They said he never get off dialysis. He's off. They said he never get rid of his uh, stents. They're gone. Come on, you hear what I'm saying? <laughs> because he's the healer. He did some natural things because the body needed that natural stuff. But he always kept the word. 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 And was there times that you thought about it'd be better to go on and be with the Lord? Sure. But when purpose compels you to stay in the planet, I'm not done. It's not over. Then you'll say, God can't fail at his word. See, all kingdoms, thank you, all nations have some kind of health care. And I like that word health care. You know why? Because I'm in health and I'm caring for it. Yes. See, I only need a cure if I'm not in health. Kingdom has a health care. It can help you stay in health. But if something attacks you, it sure can help get it out. Yeah. In fact, it guarantees yeah. God has a success rate of never failing to heal anybody. The only way a person does not get healed when been around Jesus is if they choose to not believe that he can. When he went to his hometown, they were so offended at him because he was a prophet now, because they grew up with it. It says he could only heal just a few people. It's not that he couldn't heal. In fact, it says he went to his hometown in the power of the Spirit. Yeah. And we know in the power of the Spirit, he had an anointing. He always eradicated sickness and disease. It left their bodies all the time. I said it left their bodies all the time. Okay? But in here, how they perceived him, he couldn't do it for them, not because he couldn't do it, because they chose not to. That's just like you know people, uh, maybe you even had loved ones, that refused to go to the doctor. Yeah. And they died. Not because they had to, but they just wouldn't go. They just wouldn't go. And then when you find out what it was they died of, they're like, man, that was treatable. And you know, man, they were just stubborn. Stubborn. Right? Now, Jesus also wants us to know this. In his kingdom health care system, just because healing manifests or comes to your body and you have a right to it as a child of God doesn't mean something can't come back. And Jesus clearly told this to a man that was stuck lame on a bed. And he said to him, he said, take up your mat and go. The man picks up his bed, goes, it was on the Sabbath. The religious people see him walking around and then get on to him because he's carrying his mat. But he's like, the guy who healed me, he didn't even know who he was. The guy who healed me told me to take my mat and walk. 
And they're like, who's the guy? Don't know. Don't even know his name. So he's obviously operating by the gifts, and this guy had no faith. But Jesus finds him again and says to him, told him who he was, and then says this, go and sin no more so nothing worse comes on you. So just because you become healed doesn't mean you're guaranteed never to get a symptom. Because the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. You are in a fallen world where sin is still, you're in a mortal body, not a glorified. Man, when I get my glorified body, forget about it, can't even touch it. But in this mortal body, it we, symptoms, situations, allergy, all that will try to. It will try to. Why are some people more healthy than others? In the natural. They take care of their bodies. They eat a particular way. They exercise a particular way. There's certain things that they're doing to try to naturally keep themselves healthy. Even when the first outbreak of the pandemic back in the end of 2019, 2020, there were certain people that were subject to dying quicker than anyone else. And it was based upon the conditions of their body. They, they all spoke it out. Because of these particular conditions, they are the most susceptible to it turning bad. Those that were not under those conditions, not as much. Could they pass away? Yes. Any of us could pass away. Any of us could die in a car accident when we leave. But I don't quit driving a car. A lot of fatalities out there. But at the end of the day, I go with the Lord. Yeah. It's in him I trust. It's in him I put my protection. And I understand this. I can walk in better healing if I take care of this body as well, but also have the word. Make my heart right. Keep my heart right with both God and the brethren and the world. Yeah. Walking in love because faith works by. And if love's not happening... becomes a hit issue. And so this woman's believing if I just touch him, 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 and she's had it for a long time. See, here's the thing. Most of us, a lot of times, kind of have this mentality. It, it spawns from the, I'm just a sorry sinner saved by grace. You were a sinner. You're saved by grace now. Through faith, you're actually a child of God. You're a believer. So quit associating yourself with sin life and associate yourself with a Christ life. Yeah. You're a child of God. Because as long as you associate yourself with the sin lie, then you keep talking about what you don't deserve. That means you'll tolerate stuff around your life because you don't want to bother daddy. But I don't deserve it anyway. Well, you deserve to die, yes. You deserve to be eternally separated forever. True. But God. You deserved, based upon a way of living, to have, let sickness and disease come and run rampant through your life. But God. But God. But God. And so, so a lot of times we'll get these ailments or issues happening in our body or things are going around and then we start to get them and we put up with them because they're not killing us. But they sure are aggravating. Aren't they? You know, sickness is a waste of my time. I mean, it wastes my time. <laughs> I mean, it cuts me off from doing purpose and what I want to do. I mean, I hate symptoms. But sometimes I'll get a symptom, it may manifest, and I can drive through because it's just the season of life. But that doesn't mean I need to be quicker to hear God or clear and say, now, Lord, should I just shut down? Because I could function with this and continue to believe you and speak your healing power of my life and study your word and continue to do the natural things too. And I know this is, I understand this is not going to consume me. This has got to go and I'm going to be in some place somewhere and it ain't there anymore. I know that. But sometimes the Lord would say, just go ahead and shut down and get it off now. One reason to get it off now is because then you won't pass it. Because when it's gone, it's gone. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? But she 
wanted to touch him. Jesus touched the leopard. She wanted to touch him, did touch him, and healing happened. Power left Jesus. Not only did she physically touch him, she did, but that touch was by faith. Jesus himself said, I'm willing, and he touched the guy, which is a very powerful statement, guys, because you understand this. Just the fact that Jesus touched the leopard, he should be unclean. But you know what? He actually never touched the leper. Because when he went to touch him, it immediately became whole. He actually touched the healed part of his body. In fact, I would submit to you the leprosy started to pull away the closer his hand got to him. That he didn't touch a leper, but a healed individual. And it just manifested just like that. Wow. In this lady's uh, case, same thing. When she touched him by faith, what happened? Immediately. Not three weeks from now. Not having to put up with this thing recurring again. It's gone. She's aware. It's over. It's over. Look what it says in Mark chapter 3, verse 10, because the Bible says, let everything be confirmed by two or three witnesses. It says, and he had healed many with the result that all who had afflictions, there's that same word. These are recurring things that wasn't killing you, but man, it sure is a nag. It's very discomforting. Pressed around him in order to what? Touch him. Because they heard, just like this woman, when she heard Jesus, faith comes by. And why am I saying this today? So you can hear a touch can immediately move these recurring nagging symptoms down the road. Now, I know what our next thought is right now. Man, I sure wish Jesus was in the room. Not required. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to say it again. Not required. Not required. Now, he's in the room. Make no mistake about it. He's in the room. His spirit's in the room. He's in the, wor- in the room by how he has always been and was always before we knew him as Jesus. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then the 14th verse says, And the Word became flesh, and we call him Jesus. But he was the Word long before he became the flesh of man are wrapped in the flesh of man. So the word's in the room because I've been preaching it. Which means then by all rights, Jesus is in the room. The Holy Spirit is revealing to you what he's saying. So he's in the room. The will of the Father's in the room. So he's in the room. Although we don't see him, he's here. But then he said this in Mark chapter 16, just so you'll know, this is why the church is a devastating force to the world, a devastating force to the world. Because Jesus said, the works that I do, and what works did he do? He healed people. Man, he healed them. He healed them. He healed them. They were healed. They became, he said, the works that I do, even you will do, and greater. Why? Because they don't have to come to Jesus and have these long lines of trying to touch him. Now, there are other people in the planet that are authorized to use his power and his name to get the same result. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Come on, worship team. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. And he who disbelieves shall be condemned. But again, we're not to go into all the world just to let them know they can be saved. Verse 17, these signs will accompany who? Those who have believed. Are you a believer? I said, are you a believer? In my name. In whose name? Not your name. Not my power. This ain't Pastor Earl doing it. It's in the name of Jesus. The name above every name. The King of glory. The name that of the one that's seated at the right hand of the Father. The one that's going to come back to the earth. The one that's going to call his church. The one that's going to split the sky open, put his foot down, and make a, 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 the mountains to fall and, and valleys to come up. Who will cast the devil out forever? This one in his name. 
They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Verse 18, they will. This ain't they might. It could happen. Maybe it'll come to pass. If he's willing, no, they will cast out devils. No, they will pick up servants. They, and if they drink any daily poison, it will not hurt them. They will. Who's they? Those who believe. Who are believing in the name of Jesus. They'll lay hands on the... And what's going to happen to them? They'll recover. They'll recover.